you may open the envelopes containing your papers. The exam starts now. Hopefully you've never felt that way before about a math exam or a math class, but if you have, it's okay. There's plenty of people who have uh, felt a little nervous any time the word math is attached to a class. But we are continuing on with our ProStart Level 1 Culinary Arts course, and we are on chapter number 14, <gasps> Culinary Math. <sighs> but it's okay, because there's a lot of math that we do in culinary arts already you've already been working on it in the kitchen and the fact is you didn't really think about it as being math because we're practically doing these things and that's the case with a lot of things that we do in culinary but so let's get started let's work our way through step by step so in, in order to be a good manager working in the kitchen you must have at least a basic understanding of math it's really important and being able to apply mathematical principles that we've learned in our math classes very often make an awful lot more sense when we're in the kitchen, when we're measuring things, we're multiplying things, subtracting things. But we need to make sure that we have that basic understanding so that we are as good as we can be in the kitchen and we can attain as much as we can in the kitchen. So there's a difference between when you have cooks and managers um, in the in the kitchen, you may have a line chef, a line cook who gets paid pretty well. Um, he's really good or she's really good at what they do. They make really tasty food all the time. They're following recipes. They're making certain dishes with very specific portions um, and, and controlling that so that we can have a, an accurate cost on all of our dishes. However, let me just throw this out there. If you want to be an executive chef or if you want to be a manager um, within culinary or within the hospitality industry, that's where you need to be able to have more than just the creative side. You need to have the mathematical side. It's when you get an excellent um, executive chef who has very, very good culinary skills, but really, really good mathematical skills, that that's when you're more likely to be an executive chef because you will be able to control all the costs um, in your kitchen and maximize the profitability of your organization. So as we're working through, we're going to be looking at recipe portions. We're going to be looking at uh, recipe changes that you may be making as well. We're also going to be talking about converting US to metric measurements as well. We need to be able to use both. Um, in our kitchen, we actually use a little more on the metric side these days, but we do also uh, revert back to some US measures as well, because it's good to know the difference between the two. So let's look at some very basic things. So additions. So, for example, 10 plus 2 is 12. I think most people are pretty good on that kind of thing. Subtractions. 10 minus 2 is 8. Multiplication gets a little tougher, but 10 times 2 is 20. And then division. 10 divided by 2 is 5. These are all basic things that we've been learning throughout school. Now, we need to be able to understand, though, when we start placing these in amongst the millions, the hundred thousands, the, te uh, the ten thousands, thousands, hundreds, tens, ones, and then with the decimal after that we have tenths, hundreds, thousandths, and so on and so forth. We need to be able to understand so that when we're working within our math, um, and also when we're looking at accounts as well, that we can line these columns up, that we understand that if it's in the hundreds column, then it equals a hundred, so that we don't start mixing up, because you certainly don't want to have something that's really 70 something to end up as 700 and something if it's placed in the wrong column. Um, we always assign each digit a certain value within all of these uh, specifics so that we understand exactly where it's going to be. We also work on things like carrying when we're subtracting from one column or adding to another column. 
so that, that way it makes it a little easier, especially when we're working this out on paper. So when we're subtracting, uh, we're generally borrowing. So that's when, uh, if we're going to do 3 minus 8, well, that's not going to work. So we subtract 1 over, so this now becomes 5, and we give ourselves the 10 right here. So we have 13 minus 8 that gives us the 5. And then it gives us the 5, minus 2 is 3, 7 minus 1 is 6. Very simple things that we do on, on a daily basis up in class in math. So when it comes to multiplication, then with something like this, we're going to start off, we're going to take the 4 multiplied by 2, gives us the 8. And then we're going to take the 4 multiplied by the 3, which gives us the 12, 128. Very simple. Then we're going to come down to division. Now let's take a little walk down some long division, just so we understand some basics. When we are asked to divide a number by another number of two digits or more, for instance 768 divided by 32, then the easiest way to solve these is by using a method called long division. We lay out our calculation as follows. Like in short division, we start from the left, the hundreds column, and work towards the units column. Looking at the 7, we can see that 32 does not go into 7. So we move across to the tens column and look at the 76. The next step involves a bit of trial and error. Going up the 32 times table, we can see that 32 times 2 is 64, which is less than 76. And 32 times 3 is 96, which is higher than 76. Therefore, the highest number of times that 32 goes into 76 is twice. We therefore put a 2 above the 6 in the tens column. We also write the 64, which represents the 32 times 2 underneath the 76. We then subtract the 64 from the 76, which gives us 12, as 6 minus 4 is 2, and 7 minus 6 is 1. We then look at the 12 and see that 32 doesn't go into 12. We therefore need to bring down the 8 in the units column of the 768. Next, we need to work out how many times 32 goes into 128. Again, we have to use a bit of trial and error to work this out. Often, it's easiest to get close to the answer we're looking for by using rounder numbers. In this instance, you might spot that 30 times 4 is 120, and therefore 32 times 4 is 128. Alternatively, you can just work your way up the 32 times table. Eventually, you should calculate that 32 goes into 128 four times. We put the 4 into our calculation and get our final answer of 24. Now we move on to fractions. So when we're looking at fractions, we need to remember our descriptions of these. The top number is the numerator, the bottom number being the denominator. So the numerator, that's the upper portion, that's where we're added and subtracted as whole numbers. So we're just going straight across the top. With the denominator, the lower number, that's where we're not adding and subtra subtracting uh, the same numbers. With fractions, if you have the same denominators, they're like fractions, um, and so, so those are easy to be able to work with. But, however, if you have it where the denominators are different, uh, then we're going to be looking at those to find the smallest of the denominators so that they can be divided uh, evenly between them. This is the lowest common denominator. Now we come to where we want to translate a fraction into a decimal. So when we're expressing this way, this is very often a very important thing, going in either direction, depending on exactly how you're listing things in recipes, um, or how you're being instructed uh, to be able to make certain things or work out certain numbers. So understanding that the top number right here, if you take this and divide by the bottom number, this is where you will find your decimal. So yes, one quarter is 0.25, a third is 0.33, and that's 0.33 recurring. And then you have 
uh, one half is 0 0.5, two thirds being 0 0.66. Industries generally tend to use these decimals more often, but depending upon what type of measurements you're taking, you may have to express these in different directions. When we're working with decimals, then it's all about adding or subtracting and making sure you're lining up that decimal point in the correct spot, otherwise you could have a completely wrong outcome. Uh, make sure that when you're multiplying, that you're determining the decimal point placement with that final answer, and count the total digits right of the decimal of multiplied numbers as well. When we're using decimals to uh, calculate into a percentage, you're moving that decimal two points to the right, two places to the right, and then adding that percentage sign. We're going to go more into detail on that too. When we're dividing decimals, uh, make sure you bring the decimal up above the division sign, and we're near, uh, we're rounding up or down to the nearest whole number. Less than five, remember we're, we're rounding down. If it's if it's greater than five, then we are rounding up. Dealing with percentages can seem like kind of a nerve-wracking thing, but really all we're doing, we're taking a number and we're equating it so that it's a part of a 100. It just makes it simpler to be able to get an, an idea of a, the grand scheme of what you're calculating. Let's take a look at a really simple way to work this out. In this video, I'm going to show you how to find percentages. Um, there's two ways of finding percentages, two different methods you want to use. One, how to find the percent of a number. I've done another video on that, so you can look at that one. Or in this one, I'm going to show you how to calculate the percent as a percent. If you, Let's say, for instance, you took an exam. Okay? So the exam is marked out of 80. And let's say you score 60. So now what you want to do is convert this into a percentages. So you want to say, well, what is my score, 60 out of 80, as a percentage? So if you want to, if I talk you through how to do it, you want to find 60 out of 80 as a percent times 100. So all you have to do is take your score. Divide by the number, the number that's out of in total, and multiply by 100. So this will give you 75%. If you put this into a calculator, this will give you 75%. So all you have to do to find a percent of a number is you take, you take your, let's say, score, or the number, you're in, the number that you've got, you divide it by the, the, the total, and to put it into a percent, you just need to multiply by 100. So this is the number that you've got. And you put it over the total in times 100. And that's how to find a percent. Let's start using this now in the real world where we're going to actually use it in the kitchen. It's probably one of the biggest places that we use math is in recipes. So this is a written record of ingredients and preparation steps that we use every day in the kitchen. So a standardized recipe is a format for anyone to be able to use. It should have the ingredients listed first in the order in which they're used and should then have assembly instructions after that. So by using standardized recipes, you're able to give consistent quality, consistent portion size. Uh, you'll know exactly what you need to purchase and what to prepare and how much, you reduce the amount of waste that you have, and you have accurate information to give to guests about the actual foods. You're going to meet the expectations of those guests, and you're going to control your costs. And that, as an executive chef, is how you keep your job. So at the beginning of that standardized recipe, you're going to have a title of that recipe. The recipe is then going to have a yield. What's a yield? That's the number of servings or the amount that you're going to produce if you fulfill the whole of that recipe. It determines the quantity that's needed um, in, and also the cost to produce that recipe. 
But the ingredients are the food items that are needed. They're clearly defined. The amounts and the weights is the preferred measurement. Although in some recipes, you may have the volumes that could be listed as well. This should also give you an idea of the portion size. A portion size is the individual amounts that you consume. So that cake may be a very large cake when you're looking at it. That doesn't mean that that one large cake is one portion. It might be that that's eight portions that are equally divided um, when the cake is, is finished. It will also list the temperature, time, and the equipment that you're going to need to use. Uh, it may have the size and types of pans that you're going to be requiring. It may also have uh, various different other pieces of equipment, the oven temperature, the cooking time, and preheating instructions if they're needed to. It should have step-by-step -step in, uh, instructions and directions on how and when to combine ingredients. Remember, especially in baking and pastry, we find that there are very specific methods and directions on how to mix these things. Otherwise, you'll not be coming out with the same outcome that you had hoped for initially. Some standardized recipes also have nutritional information. Um, it's not necessarily essential, but um, it uh, is sometimes listed on there, especially if those um, recipes are specific to maybe a specific type of diet plan, um, maybe a low-fat diet plan or a low-carb diet plan or a high-protein diet plan. It may actually have these specific items listed on there. In fats, it could be saturated and unsaturated fat detail on there as well, but it may list carbohydrates, protein, fiber, sodium, certain minerals and vitamins uh, that could be in there too. So the recipe is our roadmap. This has to be read very, very you know, completely and carefully to make sure that you understand everything you need. Once you read the whole of your roadmap, your recipe, that's when you can gather and put together your mise en place so that you have the equipment and the food items you're going to need. Make sure you always measure carefully and follow the instructions step by step for preparation. I love Elton Brown from Food Network. He creates some really, really good recipes and I know that they're dependable. And this is something that's really important. There's lots of recipes out there. There's lots of things that you can find um, on various different social media outlets. Um, but you may find that they're all completely inaccurate and you end up coming out with something that really isn't good at all. Alton Brown has spent a whole career going through and just breaking down into the science behind a lot of recipes that are out there. And so his detail is always very good. So look at this one, just a simple sugar cookie recipe. Uh, but as we work our way down, this tells you the yield is about Two and, a half, uh, two and a half inch cookies, it's going to give you about three dozen. It tells you the prep time you're going to have um, and how much overall time and how much time it takes to cook as well. It also gives an idea on the level. Is it, is it easy or hard to make? These ones are easy. And then it gives a very specific listing um, of all of the items that you're going to need to make way out to have your mise en place. Then over on this side, it gives specifics on what to put together in the first place and then step by step by step by step. It talks about preheating uh, uh, preheating the oven to 375 so that that way it will be ready when you come to actually cook. It gets all of the various different details on here. This is a good standardized recipe. Now it doesn't necessarily go into all of the uh, nutritional values but for this one that's not necessary. Uh, but this is a good example of a good standard recipe. And here's another standardized recipe. So this one here is for pizza sauce. So how much is this going to make? So this is going to yield enough for 20 pizzas if they are 12 inch pizzas. So the portion size is 10 ounces of pizza sauce by volume for each pizza. So then we look down, all the ingredients are listed here. 8 ounces of whole butter, 12 ounces of olive oil blend, 52 ounces of onions diced, and it lists out everything that we're going to need all the way through, even including water. It tells us about the tools and equipment that we're going to need with that sauce pot, but we need a 10-quart uh, sauce pot with a lid. 
You guys need a large whisk, heat resistant rubber spatula, standard burner, and a uh, two full size hotel pans and an ice bath. It even goes into how to cool and uh, refrigerate or freeze um, our sauce afterwards so that we're keeping our food safe. This is a very detailed list uh, so that we actually have a great standardized recipe here. Sometimes we'll be looking at converting our recipes as well. So this could be where your desired yield might increase or decrease. This can impact the total cost, but it shouldn't be dramatic um, in terms of individual portions. It should just be on the actual overall cost uh, because it's either increasing or decreasing in the yield that you're producing. The quality should not vary at all by changing our recipe as long as everything, every single thing is completely calculated correctly. You may need to change equipment because say if you're mixing something in a large mixer, it may be that you just start doing it into one of your smaller mixers instead. Cooking times may have to be adjusted depending upon the size and type of foods that you're cooking if you're doing a larger version of it. So let's look at what we do when we are converting a recipe if we're calling for more or less product. So this is where we need to start looking at our desired yield, which right here we're listing as 250 portions, but the original yield for the recipe was 96. So this means that we need to take this, this original recipe right here, which is going to give us enough for 96 portions. How do we get over to this side where, we're ha where we have the correct amount for 250 portions? So this is where we create a conversion factor. So if we take our desired yield, so that's 250, and then we divide it by the original yield, 96, then that gives us a factor of 2.6. Basically, anything that we originally had, if you multiply it by 2.6, it's going to give you the, uh, the now desired amount of 250 pieces or 250 portions um, when, we're, well, when we're converting this recipe. So let's look at a few examples. So if we have one pound of our unsweetened chocolate will suffice for 96 pieces, then when we take into account our conversion factor that we've worked out to be 2.6, then we're going to need 41.6 ounces. Now that's a difficult kind of number to work with as well. So this is where if you're working with pounds and ounces, we're then going to translate that in back into pounds and ounces, because that's normally how we actually purchase most foods. Uh, instead of purchasing them in large ounce numbers, we normally break them down into pounds and ounces numbers. And so you can see that's on the far right hand side. So we go back over to butter. Originally we needed one pound eight ounces, which is one and a half pounds, or 24 ounces. We do the conversion factor of 2.6. So now we need 62.4 ounces, which again, we break that down into pounds and ounces, where there are 16 ounces in each pound. And so we have three pounds and four, 14 ounces is the total amount needed. And we have to make sure we do that with every single item which is in our recipe. If we miss one thing, say with the flour, we need one pound of flour with our 96, but with our conversion of 2.6, we need two pounds and 10 ounces now. The fact is, if we mix, if we missed that, we only had that original one pound of flour in here, then our brownies, which we're trying to make, will not come out as brownies because they will never have the structure that that flour will give. So it's important that we work out every single number all the way down. So the formula for increasing or decreasing recipe yields comes down to deciding the, serv uh, deciding the servings that are needed. The desired yield divided by the original yield is our conversion factor, right? Where we just looked before and our conversion factor was 2.6. Um, but then multiplying each and in individual ingredient to by that conversion factor to make sure we come out with the correct amount for every single thing. Very important. Then we convert the answers to logical measurable amounts back into the pounds and ounces. Um, make, any, make adjustments to the equipment 
time and temperature is key as well so that we come out with exactly the same quality food afterwards. Now let's talk a little about US and metric measurements. So we very often use in this country uh, customary units. Most American recipes call for customary units. And so these are also sometimes called imperial units. So this is where when we're measuring volume, so we've got teaspoons, tablespoons, cups, fluid ounces, pints, quarts, and gallons. When we're looking at weights, we're doing pounds and ounces. Temperature, where most of the time we're going to use Fahrenheit. And then length, we're using inches. When we're cooking and especially baking, it's very important that we have exact measurements going on. That's why generally, especially when you're baking, you're going to be weighing your ingredients. Uh, using volumes tends to be less exact. Uh, you want to have very exact items uh, when you're weighing items for baking because otherwise recipes generally don't work out. Uh, you want to make sure you're ensuring the quality of the product you're finishing up with and minimizing any waste that you may have too. So equivalents are when we have the same amounts but they're expressed differently. Remember we talked about pounds and ounces so we can start talking about 40, 50, 60 ounces but generally we will be presenting them as pounds and ounces. Same thing when we're looking um, at, uh, at different things like tablespoons of flour versus cups of flour. So four tablespoons of flour is equivalent to a half a cup of flour. So let's take a look at a few different things that can convert one to another when it comes to using units of measure from the United States. So um, when we work our way all the way from teaspoons over on the right hand side here, so three teaspoons is equivalent to one tablespoon. So six teaspoons is the equivalent of one ounce. Working our way all the way up to the very top, where we can have 128 ounces is equivalent to 768 teaspoons. Um, but working our way all the way across to our 128 ounces is one gallon. It's also four quarts, eight pints, 16 cups, 250 tablespoons, etc. So we have different ways of working these out, but on a recipe, we're not going to, if we need a one gallon of liquid, we're not going to say that we have to measure out 768 teaspoons of liquid. Firstly, if we actually did that, the inaccuracy could be huge across such a large number of measurements you would make. And the opportunity for, miss, uh, for missing out on some of those numbers and miscounting is significant. But also, it takes a long time to be able to do this type of thing. To be more efficient with our time, that's when we would measure a gallon or possibly four quarts when we're working out exactly the measurements we need. So most of the rest of the world actually uses the metric system. The metric system is very simple. It's actually you know, measuring units of tens. It's actually a lot easier uh, for a lot of people to be able to work out, especially when we're multiplying and dividing to uh, add to or to decrease from a uh, from a recipe. So scientists, military, and healthcare professionals already use the metric system in this country as well. And generally, we're going to be using milliliter liters for volume. Temperature we're using degrees Celsius or centigrade is is the way it's called somewhere and uh, some places as well. Uh, weights is milligrams, grams, and kilograms. And then length is millimeters, centimeters, and meters. Let's take a look at some equivalent measurements when we're using metric. So one teaspoon is the equivalent of five milliliters. And then when we work our way all the way down here, one cup, one American cup, which is eight ounces, is the equivalent of 240 milliliters. One pint is two American cups which is 470 milliliters. Now this is somewhere where we can sometimes get a little mixed up. And we have to make sure we're very careful with recipes and where the recipe came from. Especially in this day and age now, where recipes can be taken from Europe, from Asia, anywhere else, and they will give you their measures as opposed to what your measures may be. This is where, uh, by using 
the metric system, you'll generally be assured of the fact that you cannot get it wrong. The fact is, is that a cup in the United States versus a cup in Japan versus a cup in Britain are all different sizes. However, with metric, it's the same the world over. So I know I prefer to go metric because then I know exactly where I stand. When it comes to uh, temperature, just a quick little conversion here for you. If you're at zero degrees Fahrenheit, which that's where our freezers generally stand, then it's right around minus 17.8 Celsius. If it's 32 degrees Fahrenheit, right at the freezing point of water, then that's zero degrees Celsius. And 212 degrees, which is the boiling point of water, is 100 degrees Celsius. Hey, look at that. Isn't that kind of simple? Zero for freezing, 100 for, uh, for boiling. Huh, kind of simple to use, right? Give it a try. When we measure temperature, Fahrenheit is what we would call the customary measure, and Celsius is our metric measure. And so in order to make a conversion on these, it may seem a little complicated, but if you have a calculator, it's pretty easy to be able to work out. So when we're doing a conversion from Fahrenheit to Celsius, we take whatever the number is, say if it's 70 degrees Fahrenheit, about room temperature, you're going to subtract 32 from that Fahrenheit number. You're going to multiply it by 5, and then divide by 9. I know it seems like something that's very convoluted, but the fact is it will come out exactly to what the Celsius conversion is. Then going back in reverse, Celsius to Fahrenheit, you multiply the Celsius number by 9, divide it by 5, and then add 32. You're literally going up in the opposite direction to take you back to Fahrenheit. This will help you if you need to convert something. And we're measuring things out. So a measurement is how much is being used. Volume is the amount of space that the ingredients take up. Weight is the heaviness of the ingredient. The count is a number of items. So say in stock, if you have five bags of, bags of chocolate chips, then the count of those is five. An accurate measurement is critical in order for us to reach the quality and quantity that we are going to need um, in order to control things in our kitchen. When we measure volume, volume is not quite as accurate as when we weigh things. Let's take a little look at volume measuring. How to measure dry ingredients. Begin by filling the measuring cup with the dry ingredient. Level off the top of the cup using a straight edge spatula over the bowl with your ingredient. If a recipe calls for a packed ingredient, like brown sugar, press down hard to compact it in the measuring cup. When you're ready to add the ingredient, Scrape around the sides and bottom of the measuring cup with a rubber spatula to remove every last bit of it. How to measure dry ingredients. When you measure by volume, it's not as accurate as when we're weighing because when we're dry, when we're measuring things like dry ingredients like herbs and spices, then there's going to be more air in between some of those fragments of these items. So you're never going to get it exact. Um, as you saw with brown sugar, you can try and pack that in there as long as that's what's called for. But still, you're going to get variations depending on how tightly one person may pack it in versus another. Same thing with flour. You saw where they scooped that flour in. Well, what if that flour was sifted first? So it, was, it had a little more air in between the fragments of, of flour that could make it less or more, more voluminous so that it would take up more space in there, but actually measure less of the actual weighted amount of that flour. These are some of the tricky things when it comes to measuring things using volume. But it's best for liquids. When we're measuring liquids, uh, liquids are very specific because they will fall and form into that shape without leaving any air pockets or any spaces in there. Uh, so fluid ounces are a volume measurement, not weight. So if it says eight 
fluid ounces, we're measuring the volume, the space that it takes up. How to measure liquids. To measure liquid ingredients, begin by selecting a liquid measuring cup, one that is see-through and has measurement marks on the side. After gathering your ingredients, place the measuring cup on a level surface. Carefully pour the liquid into the cup. Accuracy is key. If the measurement is over or under the desired measurement, pour out or add more liquid until you hit the correct mark. Pour the liquid into the mixing container. How to measure liquids. As you saw with that quick video there, the best way to measure liquids is to use a see-through measuring cup um, as opposed to the individual metal ones because then you can actually see as you're pouring it in when you're getting closer to the marking that you're looking for. Um, and they show measurement markings all the way up on the side. They'll show fractions of a cup, fluid ounces, possibly milliliters as well. So you can have that conversion between metric and standard. Uh, they may show one cup, pints, quarts, and gallons depending on how large that measuring uh, cup is. So measuring spoons, they generally have a set of four or five, and they normally come in the denominations of a quarter teaspoon, a half teaspoon, one teaspoon, and one tablespoon. So what is weight? Weight is an item's resistance to gravity. Sounds kind of weird, right? But that's the, the way it's described there is because if you're on the moon and you only have one twentieth I think it is the weight um, with uh, with gravity paying less uh, of a factor there then it's different but here on earth it's pretty much the same almost everywhere really um, and so we can rely on weight as being a more exact measurement so we're very often measuring in pounds and ounces but we can also be measuring in grams and kilograms as well so we'll use a food scale, and so this is where we can weigh foods for preparation and portion control as well. When we use a food scale, we want to decide the container to weigh the food in, place the empty container onto the scale. Well now we have an issue, because when you place that item, that, that container onto the scale, it weighs something. So we need to adjust that scale back down to zero. This has a very specific name called tear, T-A-R-E. And so when you tear the scale, that means you bring it back to zero again. And then you add the food, uh, food to that container to actually weigh just the food and not the container itself. If you're not using a kitchen scale, you probably don't realize what a game changer it is. A scale is essential, especially for baking. The only way to guarantee success is to measure dry ingredients by weight on a scale. Let me show you something. When we're not using a scale, we measure flour with the dip and sweep method. Now, even with this method, which is pretty good, we've learned that you can get up to 20% difference in the actual amount of flour measured out. 20% makes a difference. Too little or too much flour can make a cake flat and heavy instead of fluffy, tall, and tender. We use kitchen scales in all sorts of other ways that make cooking more reliable and easier. If you portion burgers on a scale, you don't have to guess if they're all the same size, and they'll all cook at the same rate. Or you can measure ingredients right into a bowl on the scale, pushing the tear button to zero out the weight of the bowl each time. As you saw on the video, so tearing accounts for the weight of the container, so that way we can actually work out from there exactly how much food we are weighing or whichever ingredient it is that we're weighing. So we can actually have uh, some scales which have a movable face scale um, and that's where we can place the container onto the scale and we adjust it back to zero. Um, so or when we have our digital scales we have a tear button to bring it back, back to zero. With a balance beam scale that's where you're placing the container on one end of the scale and you place the tear weight on the other end. Spring scales measure the pressure that's placed on a spring, the weight added to a hanging scoop. 
and then it produces uh, this this is very often used with produce departments uh, within a grocery store to weigh different items of produce this is the balance beam scale it's very often used by bakers they're preferred by them the weight is placed on one uh, one of the ends and then the produce the product is placed on the other these scoops and counterweights and pound measures are added to the scale till you get a balance between the two. Electric scales, these are where they're measured electronically. Digital scales are much, much more portable. Um, the cost on them has been significantly higher in the past, but now it's really dramatically dropped back down. And they can be very exact um, and they can also be uh, easier to use especially when you're tearing different products to measure different products as well. Taking different products that we use say in baking uh, we use lots of different types of fats uh, so this can be things like butters, margarine and shortening. The best method of measuring these is by weight. Um, when you're using volume um, or sticks this can be inaccurate especially volume with butter if you're using a solid type of a fat uh, like butter or margarine or shortening. Um, if it's solid, try to press that into a measuring cup to measure volume. Sometimes you can get air pockets going on in there. You can actually mistake um, exactly the size it should be. And then if you're making something like biscuits where you actually want to have chilled fats, um, you don't want to necessarily have that fat be warmed up enough that it's malleable, that it can be pressed into one of those scoops. You want to have it refrigerator cold or even freezer cold. Um, when you're using certain types of fats in baking as well. So measuring by weight is always the most accurate. Let's take a look at a few tips when we're measuring. So sifting removes lumps and it gives a smoother consistency. So for dry uh, powdery ingredients, uh, before we measure, if we're measuring, um, then we want, to be, uh, we want to be using a sifting method first of all. But make sure you never measure items over a mixing bowl. If you're measuring as you're dropping them in, then you could end up, what happens if you put too much uh, sugar into something or too much flour into something and now it's already mixed in with the other ingredients. Now you have inaccuracy. Now for a couple of different terms that we use in culinary arts, which are really important, especially if you want to be an executive chef and you're looking at the more specific items so that you can order accurately and you can produce products accurately. So these two uh, different names that we're going to throw out there is edible portion and as purchased. So this could be um, applied to a lot of different types of foods, but really for vegetables it's key. So vegetables are trimmed and cut before we use them. As you can see in the picture right over here, this is broccoli. This is the broccoli plant. Look at the volume of this broccoli plant that we're not even going to use. But look at the part that we're trimming off. This is what's going to go to the grocery store or to, to your supplier. But even from that, we still have product that we're not going to use. So the edible portion of broccoli, if we take a look at this right here, this is what we're most interested in, right? But what about this bit right down here? Huh. Well, this is included in what we purchased. So this is the as purchased amount. So this is what we purchased from the grocery store or from the purveyor. That's what we're getting before any kind of preparation. Once we prepare it and we cut through here and we're going to use this to go to our banquet for 100 people, then this is all they're interested in. They don't care about the stem down here. So edible portion is what we finish up and what we actually eat after it's prepared. The as purchased amount is what we have to get because that's what the grocery store is going to supply us. When we take a look at all the different types of vegetables out there, there are actually fairly standard amounts that are shown for different items. So let's take a look uh, down at where, where was our broccoli right here. Between 65 and 75% of the broccoli that we purchase will actually be yielded. So this is where we talk about the term yield. This is what we're going to actually be able to serve to our customers. So that's going to mean if we've got between 65 and 75% that's going to be our yield, 
that means we have 25 to 35 percent that could possibly be wasted. Now, we can also talk about the fact that something like the broccoli stems could be used for soup afterwards. But for right now, for the purpose of what we're working out here, we're going to say that that would be discarded. The fact is, as an executive chef, we would make sure that we're minimizing our wastage. But for the purpose of this, we want to look at what we can actually use for that particular banquet on that particular day. So let's go forward and take a look a little further into this. Here are more of our percentages um, for various different um, produce items as well. And it's remarkable on some of them how little we end up getting. So when you look at green and black eyed peas, we only yield about 40%. But that's because they're in the pod and that pod is not used in a lot of cases. Now how do we work out from our edible portion and our as purchased amounts? How do we work out um, how much it is that we need to actually purchase? Because if you're the executive chef and you have a party of 100 people coming in tonight and they all want to have broccoli with their filet mignon, we have to know how much broccoli to purchase in order to have enough edible portions to serve. So to, to determine the as purchased amount that we're going to need, we're going to divide the edible portion needed by the yield percentage. So remember, when we look back at broccoli, it was between 65 and 75 percent. So that means that in order for us to work out um, how much uh, how much we actually need to purchase, the amount purchased, we would take the edible portion. And so, say if we needed 10 pounds of broccoli um, to go for our uh, to go with our meal, then we're going to divide that by the yield percentage. So we'll say 65% is our yield percentage of our broccoli. That will give us the as purchased amount, the amount that we're actually going to need to purchase from the store. To determine the edible portion amount, we're going to multiply the as purchased amount by the yield percentage. So AP multiplied by yield percentage will give us the edible portion afterwards. Just make sure you remember, this is what we're actually going to be consuming, but we have to buy all of this. And that's the main difference that we have to, to regard there. So when we're, when we're looking at controlling all of our costs and making sure that we're maximizing everything with our yields, this is where we can use things like cookbooks, uh, purchasing textbooks, um, and using yield books as well to actually work out exactly what we need. We're always going to have to produce a little extra because mistakes can happen, problems can arise. But the fact is we need to make sure that we are as conservative as we can be within reason uh, to make sure that we are safe on everything that we're offering here. We can use conversion charts on what we, you would expect um, or, or an average shrinkage amount from, a, uh, from AP to EP amounts. And then you can actually look at yield testing as well you can actually test to see exactly how much it is that you're getting. It's a good practice as you're working through, especially if you're using large amounts or expensive products to use, to actually test it out and see exactly how much it is you're wasting. And then at the same time, try to work out, do we need to waste all of this? Can some of this be used at a later time, maybe freezing those broccoli stems, and then when you need them to make some broccoli soup, hey, I've got enough or I've got almost enough to be able to make a significant amount of broccoli soup. And all it took was a little bit of time and a little bit of consideration to wrap it up, put it in the freezer until you're ready for it. Another method that we use when it comes to more expensive things like meats is a butcher's test. Let's take a little look at what a butcher's test is. Saffron's Kitchen, and we're going to be doing a butcher's test. We're looking for a supreme of chicken. Uh, Chef Fitzgerald has agreed to do a live butcher's test for us, and he's going to take us through the process. All right, so we're going to weigh the whole bird. 1.51 kilos. So you want me to go through what I'm doing here? All right, so I'm just going to take the wings off. This is kind of a simple way to make a supreme wait with them cleaning it up, scoring around the outside of the breast. We're actually just going to pull and snap 
that makes a nice and clean uh, wing tip on both sides. Okay, so now I got all that nice and clean. Now I'm going to start butchering the breast off, removing it from the keel bolt. Second one. So you want me to read the uh, breasts now or clean them up? So clean them up just perfectly. Okay. So we're just going to clean up the breasts. This will be all the trim that's left over. Make sure there's no bone or fragments. There's one. And I'm just removing all the kind of miscellaneous fat. Okay, so there's the two breasts. So the two breasts weigh a total of 0 0.502 kilos. Now I'm going to work with my legs. There's the two legs. That's the carcass that's left. Not a lot of meat left on it. The way the carcass. So the carcass weighs 0 0.386 kilos. With wings at 0.114 kilo. And then the whole legs. Six five kilos. All the little fat that's left. We'll get me point zero three eight kilos. And that's it. That's the butcher's test. As you saw with that butcher's test, the way that he went through and he as he cut through, he very skillfully made sure that he left as little meat as possible on that carcass. The carcass we're going to use for stock, but you're not going to sell it as, consum as a consumable item by itself, right? So that means that um, out of that one and a half kilo um, chicken, the about a, about a third of that, about half a kilo, was the breast. So you had a fairly significant amount of weight there, about a third of it. And then after that, the wings and the legs, both together, wings, thighs, and legs, all together, weighed about another third um, of, that, uh, of that bird as well, slightly over. Um, but the fact is, is that so yielding your, out from that one and a half kilo bird, you're actually going to yield about one kilo of edible meat that you can actually sell. And so that's something that we have to take into account when you're working out how much meat you're going to yield to be able to sell to someone. And, and depending upon which kind of a dish you're creating, would depend upon what type of meat you, uh, you're going to use as well. You may have something that you want to use all leg and thigh meat, or you may have something where you want to use all white meat. So depending on exactly what you need, is going to depend on what you're going to have to calculate uh, to be able to make sure that you have enough to take care of all of your guests. But anytime you're trimming, where you saw him trimming off the excess bits of fat or cartilage or making sure there's no excess bones anywhere in there, um, anytime you're doing any of that, that's all shrinkage. That's all amounts which you're not going to be able to sell afterwards. We have different types of what we call trim. So we have um, usable trim. So these are this is things like when we have beef 
we may have uh, certain parts of a, a cow carcass, a beef carcass, that we can use. It's edible, but the thing is, though, it's not going to be solid pieces of meat. That's when we're going to be using that for ground beef. Then we also have non-usable trim, uh, which is going to be things like the gills and the scales of fish. We can't use those. We can't even use those for stock. Um, so that's just the way it is when it comes to that type of expense that you're just going to have to eat. As I mentioned before, it's important that we go and test certain items, whether it's going to be a high cost item or if it's going to be a large volume item. This is where we want to test just to make sure that our, uh, that our amounts are going to be accurate. And so it's a good thing to have a set of scales near you so you can start testing. Say with our asparagus that you can see over on the right here, when we purchase this, this is the as purchased amount right here, because that's how it's been trimmed off coming out of the earth. But we're not necessarily going to use all of this base amount. We're going to trim off the most woody part down here. So this part here is our trim, and then we're going to actually use a peeler to take off the excess woody part at the bottom part of this stem here. So again, we've got more trim right here. So when we, when we purchase 10 pounds of asparagus, we need to make sure that what we're yielding is still going to be sufficient for what we need. That can significantly impact your operation's food cost percentage um, if you have a significant overrun. And all it can take is that instead of the chef slicing around here, if they slice around here, when you do that 100 times over, then all of a sudden you're wasting a significant uh, amount of asparagus. You might not have enough now. When we start looking at things like convenience foods, and I'm not just talking about prepackaged, uh, completed meals that you may get at the grocery store. I'm talking about some items that could just be as, as simple as something like sli uh, peeled and sliced carrots that you're purchasing um, in a restaurant, because it might be that you don't have the space to be able to store all these things. You might not have the uh, the time and the labor um, that, you, that you can put into doing these kinds of things. You may not have uh, the skilled labor to be able to slice the carrots exactly to the thickness that you want them to be so they come out evenly every single time. And so it may be that you're purchasing them in completely done. You're going to find that that price is higher because that price is going to include the fact that the company that sliced them is going to take into account they had this wastage up on top and they're going to peel them as well so they get wastage all the way down the shaft of the carrots. Things like that is going to drive the costs up. Let's have a little reminder now before we talk more about standardizing to, uh, to maintain our costs, why it's so important to have standardized recipes. A recipe is one of the most useful tools in the professional kitchen. The ability to read a recipe correctly and to use it in various ways is critical to a food handler's success. A recipe is a written record of the ingredients and preparation steps needed to make a particular dish. Recipes can follow any format. However, recipes used in operations, called standardized recipes, must follow a format that is clear to anyone who uses them. Standardized recipes play an important part in a successful professional kitchen. They help to control costs, quality, and the consistency of products. A standardized recipe includes several parts. The first is the name. This is the title of the recipe. Next is the yield. This is the number of servings or the amount the recipe will make. This information is used to determine how much of the recipe quantity is needed. The yield is critical to understanding how much it will cost to produce the recipe. Ingredients are the food items needed to make the recipe. They are usually listed in the order in which they are used. This makes it easier to follow the recipe and not forget any ingredient. Each ingredient must also be clearly defined. This could be the color or type of ingredient required in the recipe. Amounts of each ingredient are also given on the recipe. Using specific amounts makes it more likely that the finished product will be what was intended. After ingredients is the portion size. This is the individual amount that serves a person. Temperature, time, and equipment are also included in standardized recipes. This includes the size and type of pans and other equipment needed, the oven temperature, 
cooking time, and any preheating instructions. The step-by-step -step directions describe how and when to combine the ingredients. The nutritional information of the recipe may also be included. This is not required, but it is useful. The amounts of fat, saturated and unsaturated, carbohydrates, protein, fiber, sodium, vitamins, and minerals are usually included. The recipe is a roadmap for the cook. Read it completely, gather and place all ingredients, measure carefully, and follow the instructions. This will lead to a consistent, delicious dish for your customers. Once you have your recipe, this is when we can actually uh, work out a standard portion cost. So this is when we're going to take our standard recipe cost and the cost per serving. We need to know the ingredients amounts, the ingredient amounts that are needed, the market price of those ingredients, and then we're going to multiply or divide the ingredients by those prices. We're going to add them all together to get a recipe cost. We'll divide that recipe cost by the yield to get our standard portion cost. So say if it costs $10 to make that chocolate cake, that chocolate cake um, is uh, yields 10 separate portions, 10 separate slices of cake, then it's going to be $1 per standard portion cost. So let's look at an example of our standard recipe cost calculation, just taking into account this brownie recipe. So let's take a look at the first item on here. So we have unsweet chocolate. We need one pound of unsweet chocolate to make our brownies. It costs $5.50 per pound. All right. So when we add this in to our calculator right here, we have that one pound. We multiply it by the 550 that it's going to cost for that one pound of unsweetened chocolate. So it gives us a total ingredient cost of $5.50. Well, that was easy because it's just one pound. Now let's take a look at, take a look at the butter. So that's one pound and eight ounces. So that's one and a half pounds uh, that we're going to need of butter. The butter costs $2.50 per pound. So now we take our one and a half pounds of butter, we multiply that by the $250 um, dollars that it costs per pound. So the actual ingredients cost for this recipe is $3.75. And we just carry on. So eggs, one pound eight ounces, which is one and a half pounds. Eggs per pound of $5.50. And so we add in one and a half pounds of eggs, five fifty per pound. So we multiply that out. So the eggs will cost us $8.25. And we do this continuing all the way through our recipe. This is the amount we're going to need. This is how much each unit costs. We multiply those together to get our actual ingredient cost um, for creating the recipe. So our recipe now is $30.44 for all of those ingredients to fulfill the recipe that we're, that we're trying to create. When we're working out costs, sometimes it's easier to be able to work out how much every one of our ingredients is down to the ounce instead of by the amount we're purchasing it. So when we take our, uh, when we take our brownie recipe and we look at our chocolate, our chocolate is sold in pound blocks. And, uh, and so that's nice and simple. Other things are not necessarily sold in pound blocks. And so what's sometimes easier uh, is to go and work out exactly how much everything is per ounce. So all we're doing, we're going to take however much the item actually is, and we're going to divide it by 16, because there are 16 ounces and one pound, and that gives us the ounce price. And so we work that out all the way down our list of all of our ingredients, so we know exactly how much each item is. When we're costing recipes, we need to uh, round out the cost per ounce price after all of the calculations. Don't try and round up or round down um, after each individual ingredient. Otherwise, you're going to find that things can get um, very inaccurate. You want to wait until you get all of the calculations together and you get a truer and more accurate total recipe cost. The ingredients uh, co uh, costs are then rounded to the nearest cent and portion costs are uh, around it to one tenth of a cent. 
When we're looking to work out the cost per portion, we're going to divide the total recipe cost by the portion yield. When we're looking at our brownies again, so when we look at that as an example, we're going to take the total recipe cost, so it's $30.44. The yield for that recipe was 96 brownies. The cost per portion is equal to the total recipe cost, $30.44, dividing it by the yield for the recipe, which was 96 individual brownies. So it's $30.44 divided by 96 is 31 point one seven zero eight three 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 per portion we're not going to go all the way through like this right we're going to take the the total cost per portion it's 32 cents because we're rounding up to the uh, to the last two decimal points we get to here the one that's right after where we're going to cut off that's a that's five or above so we're going to 32 so 32 cents per portion So when we're looking at all of our prices, we have to be very careful to stay relevant and stay accurate. So pricing recipes every six months is a good idea to do. Um, comparing them to national price indexes twice a year. What is that? Let's take Let's say you're an economist trying to figure out if things in the U.S. are getting more or less expensive. Well, you can look at the national averages, but that doesn't tell you the whole story. After all, over in California, the price of surfboards might be skyrocketing. While in sunny Florida, golf carts are selling for record low prices. Dentistry in Wisconsin could be pricier than ever, but you might get a good haircut in Seattle for under 10 bucks. To measure how far a dollar will go, government bean counters blend and weigh numbers to make something called the Consumer Price Index, or CPI. It's a good barometer of inflation, but it's far from perfect. For one, everyone has different expenses, but the CPI doesn't take that into account. Professional athletes, couch potatoes, firefighters, and dog walkers aren't likely to be buying the same things. And chances are no one's buying all the hundreds of items to include out the CPI. Another problem. People tend to adjust their buying habits when the cost of one item goes up or down. If the price of steak jumps, you might just buy chicken instead. If apples are getting expensive, you go for bananas. So to track these habits, there's a second number called the chain CPI. It's usually a lower number, and many economists argue that it's more accurate. But while some politicians think we should be using the chain CPI to adjust social security payments, others say it won't amount to much more than a pay cut for some recipients. So, is life in America getting more or less expensive? Well, that all depends on what you're buying. By using these indexes, they can actually help us to understand if prices are increasing and decreasing just in general as well. Total recipe costs um, are raised or lowered by percentages at times by using these. Sometimes the portion of yield cost can be recalculated. It's a good idea to completely do a revision every single year of all of your recipes just to make sure that you're on track. Otherwise, that brownie that you're selling for a dollar, if after, after six months or a year, you look at that and you realize that it's costing you 98 cents to produce it, all of a sudden you may find that you're getting out of business rather than doing well in business. When we're costing out our recipes, sometimes we'll be combining portions to actually work out our costs. So this could be that we're totaling the cost of a full meal. Um, so this could be where some organizations calculate their uh, food items and add them all together. Others average out the cost of extra items and add-ons. When we're looking at things like salad bars, when you, you see that in the picture over here, the food cost at the salad bar can be a little bit difficult to start working out because this is where patrons go over and they help themselves. So when someone's helping themselves to it, how do we know how much it costs? Because we're not telling anybody then they're not allowed to fill their plate up or maybe overfill that plate. We're not telling them they, that they can't take those tomatoes because they're out of season and they cost more. We just allow them to help themselves. So we need to understand so that we can control the costs on our salad bar. So the way that we work this out, we're going to be doing a cost per serving. We're going to divide the number of uh, patrons into that total cost. So just to give you a little example, you're going to take the salad bar cost. In this case, we're going to say it costs $95.68 to create this entire salad bar. We had 84 patrons that came through that salad bar paying 
to enjoy the food that was on there. So all we do is we take $95.68 and divide it by 84, and that gives us $1.14 per serving. Wow, that was a lot of information, right? There's lots of terminology, lots of things for you to remember in there. You may need to go back and, and re-look at this as well. Sometimes you may not remember all of these different terms, but they're really important for you to be able to understand. Make sure that, you are, well, that you're using them regularly as well as another way that we can make sure we remember them. So when we're in class, when we're working in the kitchen, I'll be asking you about these things so it stays in the forefront of our mind. We're also going to be doing um, lots, of, uh, lots of multiplying and dividing on our recipes in general, just so you get some good practice at that as well. Just make sure when you're multiplying a recipe or dividing a recipe, do it for every single ingredient. Don't forget any of them, because otherwise it won't work out, especially if you're baking. I uh, hope you enjoyed this, and I will see you all in the kitchen. Cheers!